Hello everybody, my name is Ruth Allen, I'm the Chief Executive of BASWA and I'm chairing the session today. Uh, welcome to this webinar which is coming to you from BASWA, British Association of Social Workers and SKY, the Social Care Institute for Excellence. Today we're presenting and discussing the work that BASWA and SKY have been doing uh, together to develop digital capabilities, practice and ethics guidance for social workers. And we've been working on this for the last uh, 12 months or so, following a commission by NHS Digital and Health Education England. So we've done this with the involvement of a whole host of stakeholders and practitioners and people who use social work services. And we want to thank everyone who's been involved um, in helping us with this and supporting the project. And some of you may well be listening and watching this webinar today. So thanks very much for that. We're going, I'm going to start by introducing um, some panelists. And we have four panelists, one, one of them, and three other panelists um, who will be presenting um, at the beginning of the webinar. And so if I could just ask each of you to uh, uh, introduce yourselves. Denise, could I start with you? Yes. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Denise Turner and I'm a senior social work lecturer, but I'm here in my capacity of chair of the advisory group for the Digital Capabilities Project. Thank you. Godfrey, could I come to you? Hello, everybody. Good afternoon to you. My name is Godfrey Barhin and I am the policy and research officer for Bazwa. And Mark, can I come to you? Hi everyone, it's Mark Nicholas here. I'm the Chief Social Worker for NHS Digital and one of the commissioners of this project. Uh, I also have responsibility for a number of the uh, products that NHS Digital produces uh, that are kind of uh, citizen facing, you might say, like the NHS website and the NHS app. Great, thank you. So um, before we get into the content of the webinar proper, I just want to explain how the session will run and how you can participate. Um, so the panellists will be making some short presentations uh, each for the first half of the session and then we will want to take your questions uh, in the second half of the hour. Um, so we would really encourage you to use, there's a white panel um, uh, probably on the bottom right hand side of your screens you can see there's a little orange box with a, with a with a with an arrow in it you want to go down to where it says chat and click on there um, and if it's not open already it will open up and you can write your question in there and we really need your questions and comments throughout so please just send them through we might not be able to answer all of them i'm sure you'll appreciate that but what we will try to do is pick up on the main themes and it's really important that we know what your comments and thoughts and questions are even if we can't address um, all of them so please just start asking questions in uh, in the chat box um, as, as time goes on and then i will read them out and ask the panelists um, to address them uh, particularly in the second part um, of the session so thank you i should also say that the session is recorded this will be available afterwards for anybody to access online freely. It comes with a number of resources, which include uh, the presentations that you're going to see and some other resources to uh, help you find uh, the materials that we're going to talk about. Um, so it is being recorded and, and available for you and others. So do feel free to let anybody else know um, about it afterwards. Um, before I hand over to Denise, who's going to start um, on the, with the, her presentation first, I just wanted to say a few words about the extraordinary uh, circumstances and times that we're, we're going through and really the um, huge relevance of this project and the resources that we've produced. We hope they'll be relevant and we'd like to hear from you about whether they feel relevant. When we started this 12 months ago, this was clearly not where we thought we would be in terms of having to use digital in a really kind of accelerated uh, form under pressure um, because virtual communications have become uh, some of the only ways that we can communicate both with each other as professionals um, but also of course with the people that we're working with so in many ways digital has become even more of a lifeline um, and so the value of digital and letting us keep in touch professional to professional and with people using services is really uh, kind of writ large um, in this situation. We're also facing some real practice and ethical challenges during this period. 
um, as we've had to reduce face-to-face -face, uh, contact to protect ourselves, to protect the people that we're working with, um, to protect the country at large, and of course turning to digital in that. And I think we also know that as families, um, individuals are in lockdown um, with schools, community facilities, cafes, um, community uh, uh, facilities such as pubs and restaurants are shutting down. We know that families and individuals are potentially under particular strain. This is a very, very extraordinary situation for us all to be in, and it will um, impact, impact people in, a, in difficult ways, uh, differenti differentially across, across the population, depending on their circumstances and resources. So we know there are some additional social stresses out there that are affecting people. Um, and will have long-term impacts, uh, both on them, but also on social workers and on services. So digital connectivity is helping us um, in many ways uh, at this time and, and helping people uh, that we're serving. We know there's also uh, risks. There are online risks, digital risks that are part of what we're going to be talking about. Um, and some of those may be made more difficult, for instance, with uh, children who may not be able to go to school, not have all the checks and balances, not have all the close relationships with um, supportive adults. Um, so many things have been turned upside down and we're going to be able to explore today the real value of digital, um, the risks of digital and how we mitigate those, how we use digital well. Um, and that is about what's happening now in these extraordinary times, but also about the long term. So the session won't all be about um, the COVID-19 situation. Um, it will be about the long term. We know that many of you will be in practice and actually dealing with um, these challenges and having to make difficult ethical decisions um, every day right now. So we hope that this is helpful. We hope it's relevant. We hope it's supportive. And please do send us your thoughts and queries so that we can try and address those. Um, this is not a project that just ends. This is a project that is ongoing. We finished this phase. We know that there is other work happening out there to develop uh, digital uh, capability support for social workers. This is an ongoing uh, thing, something that will grow in our profession. Um, so we need to keep learning. And you sending in questions today um, is part of our ongoing learning and part of this project going forward. So thank you. So I'd like to turn um, now to Denise and uh, you'll start the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ruth. Um, yes, I'm I'm here today, as I've said, in my capacity as chair of the advisory group for the Digital Capabilities Project. Um, I'm going to tell you a, a little potted sort of history of what we did in the advisory group. Um, and I think I just want to start by acknowledging what you've said, Ruth, which is that um, when I started as chair, I certainly wasn't imagining that we were all going to be in the position that we're in now and um, how we've had our digital capabilities tested and accelerated in this environment and I know it's been a, a challenge for a lot of us. I came into the role of as chair through um, a long-standing interest in digital capabilities in social work education but I've certainly had mine challenged in the last few weeks. So just to tell you a little bit about um, the advisory group, the project itself uh, is part of the building a digitally ready workforce um, and it was commissioned by Health Education England uh, with the support of NHS Digital and Mark will be telling you a little bit more about NHS Digital in a bit. Um, so the advisory group uh, guided the work of the project basically and it brought together in one room a range of stakeholders um, from all sorts of sectors um, including adults, young people, um, Social Work England, you know, uh, technology specialists, carers, experts by experience, many um, others. And one of the things that, that we did is we tried to sort of drill down into some of, of, of what practitioners and those using social work services might want to see. And I've just given an example of that here in, in that one of the things that preoccupied us quite a lot at the beginning was what we mean by the digital actually because digital can mean many different things to many people it can mean robots or it can mean something as simple as putting a table in word so and i think we acknowledge that and we've given a definition of that in the capabilities statement um, can i have the next slide please 
So one of the things that I wanted to emphasize is that we heard a lot from um, people that are using social work services and um, from carers, from people that have used services in different ways. This is Jordan, who um, was our care lever advisor for the Digital Capabilities Project. And Jordan's voice was one that um, I certainly found very, very useful in the project in terms of um, bringing, bringing the, the, the real life into the room and helping us in the advisory group to think about how we work with people that are using services in, in moving the statement forward. So can I have the next slide? Thank you. Um, one of my particular interests, because I'm a social work educator now, and I have been for, for the past few years, um, is in the social work education aspect um, that we discussed in the advisory group and that's also in our stakeholders report. Um, one of the things that came out of the stakeholders report is that um, there was quite a mixed reception to what people are learning in, in social work programmes. And that's something that's developed in, in the rest of the project. So they were very clear things that people wanted to see, um, that qualifying social work programmes needed to embed digital skills in order that practitioners were then able to build on and develop those as they go through their careers. And also um, that higher education institutions should develop CPD programmes. Um, embedding digital capabilities so not just doing a session and saying right we've dealt with the digital now um, but actually embedding those things across programs into CPD and also into specialist areas so as I said previously there's no one thing called the digital um, we need to be looking at different aspects of that and specialist skills for specialist areas and also that users of services in the way that we modelled it within the advisory group, users of services should be involved in digital social work education. And for me as an educator now, that also includes our students, um, that students in higher education institutions are the users of our service. So we need to be looking at how do we develop digital applications and digital training that is useful to them as they move on into placement and then throughout their careers. Next slide, please. Thank you. And this I put in, um, this is Amanda Taylor Bezik's work and Amanda was the uh, one of the advisors to the Digital Capabilities Project. I put this in, um, in the context of what Ruth was saying before, because many, many of us are working at home and in, and in unprecedented ways and we're linking up using our digital skills in ways that we wouldn't have considered we would need to use them and I think this is very useful in thinking about how boundaries may be being blurred and crossed at the moment it's um, you can see it's pretty straightforward and I think it's a very useful tool I use it in my um, social work education modules and what I teach and I just thought it would be perhaps a useful thing for people to be able to map at the moment in terms of what they're using um, and how and why, while, while so many of us are working in unprecedented ways. Thank you. Next slide, please. Okay, and that's moving on to Godfred. Thanks very much indeed. Thanks, Denise. Godfred, can I turn to you now? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Denise, and uh, another warm wo uh, welcome to our audience. Can I have the next slide, please? So I want to pick up from where Denise left off, and um, I want to talk briefly about what we can in digital technology can enable us to do as social workers. And I just really want to emphasize that, especially at this time, digital technology enables us to if you like, fulfilled your organizational and work processes dimension of social work. But perhaps equally more importantly, it also allows us to really achieve some important core social work objectives. And I'll, and I'll explain that. And, and I'll finish the presentation by talking about some of the technical and legal and ethical issues that we need to bear in mind as we increasingly 
use digital technology at this time. Next slide, please. So to start off with, I want to give a, a context to the, to, to the presentation. We, we're discussing this now um, because perhaps we can identify three main contextual issues. One, which has been mentioned by, by my colleagues is that increasingly, as digital technology increases in their capacity and we as private citizens and also professionals engage with it more in our, in our lives, social work too as a profession is experiencing increasing digitalization. And some have referred to this as e-professionalism, um, others have referred to this as e-social work. So against this background or this backdrop of increasing use of digital technology, the ca capability statement for social workers which has been developed therefore responds to this and identifies the knowledge, the skills and importantly the values and ethics that social workers need to reflect on and in fact demonstrate in their work and engagement with digital technology. The, the third point has been mentioned by colleagues, but I think it's, it's important to highlight it again, that with the recent or ongoing COVID-19 emergency, digital technology has really shown itself to be one of the key ways for us to continue managing the processes of social work. And so th this, these three issues are the, are the, are the context to the, the current discussion. Next slide, please. What I want to emphasize on this slide here, though, is that digital enables us to fulfill some of the organizational and process dimensions of social work, you know, our case recording, our our storage of documents, our, our capturing data, which can be used by organization in different ways. However, perhaps more Im importantly, we also need to think about digital technology as an enabler for us to achieve other social work, core social work objectives, such as inclusion and enabling people who use services to be involved in co-production of care plans, empowering people to as much as possible display control and choice over the services that they, they, they access. Elements of self-determination, digital technology can also enable us to do that. And one core social work value is reduction of equality and in fact combating inequalities and digital technology in some ways can also enable us to engage with that and then i finally i want to emphasize as has been mentioned by colleagues already that digital technology also enable us actually to do safeguarding work as well as also address some of the safeguarding issues that the people we work with encounter in their daily lives next slide please So on this slide, I just want to expand further on, on, the, on the points that I finished um, off on in the last slide. And I want to say more about what digital technology can enable us to do. And I'm drawing the, the, this, present, this part of the presentation from the purpose section of the capabilities statement. So digital technology can enable us to do co-production of assessments, for instance, you know, really what might seem as straightforward, simple technology, such as enabling people who we work with to, can, to do self-assessments and send them to us for incorporation into the assessments that we do. Digital technology enable us at this point in time where we're being asked to engage in social distancing to reduce the rate of infection of COVID-19 
digital technology can enable us to bridge that gap around relationship-based practice. And then importantly, digital technology can also be used in service provision and enabling people to manage their own care. Some of you may be familiar, for instance, with the Mind of My Own app um, used by uh, looked after children and also Autonomy app, which enables adults with learning disability to manage their routines around their home. So digital technology enables us to fulfill these other core aspects, core elements of social work. And I think at this time, where we may be preoccupied with keeping services running, we need to think about digital technology enabling us to do more than just that. Next slide, please. So I want to finish by discussing some of the issues that we need to consider currently as we, we engage more and more with digital technology. The, these are contextual issues that we need to try and anchor our decision making around digital technology on. So there are practice issues, for instance, uh, around well, the organize, our employers and the organizations that we work with, what sort of infrastructure and what sort of digital capacities do they have? And, you know, frankly, being social workers, I don't, I, I don't know about um, our audience, but I, I do not really know the details, the technical details of the digital technology that I use. And it's therefore important for us to really, at the very least, know which part of the organization can we can access for advice and support around these elements. The bits that we as professionals perhaps have more control over or, or, or is around social work ethics and values. And so those, those always have to underpin and underscore our engagement with digital technology because the same ethical issues that we encounter offline also manifest in our engagements with digital technology. So issues around confidentiality, for instance, issues around respecting people's dignity, issues around um, equality, treating others as we ourselves would like to be treated. Those core is value base of social work also apply in our engagement with digital. And then drilling down a bit further from that, there are specific issues around digital ethics, which also apply. And then moving on from that, or in addition to that, we always need to be mindful of what, what the local policies and procedures are. We, we, we have been speaking, for instance, a lot about social workers asking questions demanding answers such as, can I use this particular app? Can I use that particular um, app? This is the, the answers to these questions really um, can be drawn, can, can, be, can be attained from understanding further what local policies and procedures um, suggest, advise, or enable us to do. And then to end off with the critical for us to understand the law around engagement with digital technology. We're all familiar with the Data Protection Act 2018, for instance, which, which tells us what local authority and also employers and professionals statutory duties are. What I want to highlight though, that all these contextual issues that I've just explained really should be underpinned by our core social work knowledge, skills, and ethics. So if I take one social work skill, for instance, such as information um, searching, you know, we may not have all these answers around um, local procedures readily at hand, but skills such as information searching at least enable us to get to what those answers may be or might be. Next slide, please. So thank you very much. And I'll hand over to Mark now. Thanks, Thanks, Godfrey. Godfrey. 
Mark, could you just hold on for one sec? I think it would be quite good to take a couple of questions, if that would be okay. So I'm slightly changing the order, which is, um, sorry, panellists, but I think it would be good because I think I can see some questions coming in. Um, and we've, we've had quite a lot of presentation. We'll come back to you, Mark, if that's okay. Um, and, uh, and, and, hear, and hear that. So, um, I mean, one of the questions that's, that's been coming in, um, perhaps to all, to all three of you, um, is, I mean, how do you think that digital technology is impacting on uh, boundaries and, the, rela and, uh, and uh, the relationship between social workers and service users at the moment? I suppose particularly at the moment with this sort of accelerated um, uh, use of, of technology in, in this difficult time. Do you think it's having, what do, what do you think about the, um, the, how professional boundaries are affected? Um, by increasing use of different inter technology interfaces. Denise, would you, did you want to, or Godfrey? Yeah, Mark. <laughs> yeah, just throw myself into that one. Um, right. I think, I think that um, we've been learning, haven't we, as we, as we went, as we go along, how uh, best to maintain boundaries when we're using digital technology. And, um, you know, one of the, one of the ways that I can evidence that is re remembering about 10 years ago, uh, having to talk to a, a social worker about uh, their settings on Facebook, um, you know, which were which allowed uh, clients to be able to uh, access um, what their kind of recreational activities were, and and just thinking about and learning about um, how we use digital technology in an appropriate and a boundary way is something which I think people will do uh, as they use that digital technology, but that doesn't preclude. Um, the value of uh, appropriate guidance as well. And I think that um, for us in the profession, we need to stay on top of that and make sure that we're providing guidance as the uh, digital technology comes on stream. Thank you. Godfrey, did you want to come in? Yeah, Ruth, thanks. I think um, the, the current emergency really challenges is challenging the boundary between our professional and our private selves. Um, as we engage more and more with digital technology ourselves, simply to keep on being social workers at this time, we leave more and more of our digital footprints, um, which others can access. So there's that, there's that um, collapsing of, of, of the boundary between our private and professional self. Also, Increasingly, as people, um, COVID-19 is leading to fast changing situations. The people who we work with actually want information um, quite quickly, um, often in, in, in during periods which may not necessarily be office hours. So again, in order to think about how to meet their needs, that challenges our notion of, well, this is after five o'clock, that's my private time. Perhaps people are demanding more answers, more support outside of those standard office hours. So again, that's really leading to questions around how we manage that professional and, 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 and private self. And then the third point I want to make about that is around practice standards, professional standards, for instance. You know, COVID, the COVID-19 emergencies, we're asking social workers to, to demonstrate different skills, which traditionally we may not have been required so much. The question therefore is, as these new demands are placed on us, are we able to demonstrate those skills and capabilities, um, which will show our, our skills as, as professionals or professional social workers. So I think okay. these are the two ways that I think they're, they're challenging. Uh, okay. That. Thanks, Godfrey. Thanks. Denise, did you want to come in? Yeah. Just quickly building on what Mark and Godfrey have already said, just to say that I think that um, it's a sort of obvious thing to say, but a lot of this has happened very quickly. You know, new digital technologies are being developed all the time. And so one of the risks that I think we face both as social work educators and as practitioners is that is that we start to do things through convenience because we are overwhelmed actually by by some of the um, ethics, GDPR, data protection, all the things that we need to think about 
And I think that sometimes it's also about the language. I've had a lot of um, discussions myself around the use of WhatsApp, which I know can be a very vexed question. And, you know, but there are very simple things. For example, people may think that because uh, platforms claim to be encrypted, that means that they have they carry no risk. And actually, that's not the case. So I think going back to what both Mark and um, and Godfrey was saying, we, we have to start thinking about ethics in a different way. We have to start thinking about boundaries in a different way. And we have to, to be very clear, certainly for me as a social work educator, that we're modeling that for our students as well, so that they start to be thinking about those things at, at the education and training stage. Um, before they become, you know, more overwhelmed by the demands of practice as well. So that was all. Thanks. Thanks, Denise. Yes, I think one of the things that we've um, been clear about throughout the development of this project is really getting conversant with the language of digital in a really broad and rich way. It's a journey we're all on. There's a bit of a generational issue, the whole issue about younger people growing up in a virtual world, which is as real as the real world. And those of us who are of a different from a different generation are um, have grown up through different eras of digital and it's moving along that's a bit of a um, you know that's, that's a bit of a cliche in a way but it is true and I think there's something about um, us under if working with younger people is understanding what the virtual world really means for people and what that is like to inhabit it and our capabilities really have um, that you'll see online if you go to the document cover the, um, the, those practice capabilities about understanding um, the ways in which people who use services um, use digital and what we therefore need to understand. If we're going to be alongside people as a core social work um, practice imperative, we need to be alongside them in their, in their experience and use of digital. Um, and then of course the wider issues around how we literally understand the technologies that we use and how we know how to make an, have an impact in demanding the technologies and the training and resources that we need to, to use digital to the full for, for, the, for the benefit of, of service users, which is more than you, um, using an online um, recording system, which is often, or, or and also, I'm just, 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 I'm gonna ask one more question, Mark, and then I'm gonna come to your presentation, if that's okay. There's one question here that's come in about most organizations have a paucity of policies, and the ones there are tend to be outdated, not progressive, tend to be don't do rather than seeing digital as enabling and not just as a risk. So, um, so who, and this is who nationally will take that on. So I think this is a bit of a plea about how do we influence um, employers and organizations, many of whom are getting very you know, digitally savvy, but some much less so. And we picked this up in our consultation that a lot of social workers are working in environments where they don't feel um, digital is seen positively enough or creatively enough. Um, I don't know, Mark, would you would you like to come in on that when it might might be something that you? Sure, yeah. Um, so NHS Digital have been working with the local government association, the LGA, for the past four years. Um, and we've been working to develop uh, digital innovation uh, within local authorities. Um, we, we've not I think in order to be able to tackle the problem, that particular problem, and to make sure that local authorities are, and, and social care departments in, in, in particular uh, are looking at digital as an enabling tool, we, we need um, a national organisation, perhaps like ourselves, uh, on the digital side, we need an organisation with, um, with influence over local authorities such as the LGA, but we also need the input from the profession, you know, in, in the guise of, of Baswa and, and Sky and, and perhaps some of the individuals that are on this call as well, to be able to um, provide a voice for social work um, and, and, and say that some of the ways which local authorities are approaching uh, the issue of the digital are, are not really fit for purpose and we need to do something about them. Thank you. Uh, Denise, did you want to? No, D D Godfrey, yes, sorry. I do. Yes, you do. Sorry, sorry, the oh. hand was hovering too low. Carry on. <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, I uh, just a quick, just a quick one, really, which is just to pick up on on the question and to say that that I completely agree. I think that um, 
uh, digital technologies have been conceptualized as mostly harmful and actually I think with you know one of the things that I've always tried to argue in what work I've done is that at the they are the same as relationships. They are a relational tool and some relationships are harmful and some relationships are positive. Relationships are not uniquely positive. Um, and I think that we, we bring that to um, the ways in which we use digital technology. We're seeing that, as we've said at the moment, you know, we, we are able to use digital technologies in very uh, constructive ways to, um, to connect people at a time when we can't connect. There are also people doing you know, not so positive things with digital technology, but I just wanted to say, and I know that it's in there in the capability statement that it's very important that we look at the positive um, and that we, we help people to carry that work forward. That was Thank all. You. Great, I'd like to come to Mark if that's okay now, so that we, Mark, would you like to go through your um, slides now? Sure, yeah, um, I'll hopefully not, take too long doing this uh, because I'd be really interested in uh, questions on uh, what everybody's presented today. So first of all, a little bit about me and my career. So I've spent about 50% uh, of my career working in adult social care and 50% in children's. And certainly one of the things that I've been keen to do with this piece of work, uh, but also with some of the other things that we're working on in NHS Digital is to look at what we're being commissioned to do uh, with mainly adult social care and then look at its utility across children's social care. We are one profession across children and adults. Uh, and I think if we're developing um, products for one part of the profession under the guise of the Department of Health and Social Care, we should be looking at how those products can be used uh, in children's social care with the Department for Education. Um, so just moving on to slide two, please. Uh, I wanted to say a little bit about NHS Digital to, uh, for those of you who, who may not know who we are, we used to be the Health and Social Care Information Centre, which uh, those of you who worked in adults will have heard of, I'm sure. But we're an executive non-departmental public body sponsored by DHSC, so uh, what used to be called a Quango. <laughs> um, we, we're the key organisation uh, using information and technology to improve both social care and health. Uh, and obviously the, the main focus of that is on the health service and uh, hence the NHS branding but we also have a role within social care as well which I'll say a little bit more about in a minute. Um, just to draw out some of the key things that we do which are specific uh, and, and perhaps more interesting uh, in the social care field, we provide the NHS mail platform which allows a secure transfer of information between uh, NHS mail addresses, but also between NHS mail and other secure email um, standards. Um, we provide NHS UK. This is one of my uh, specific uh, responsibilities within the organisation. Uh, the NHS website, we've got uh, a million people visiting that website every day, which actually went up to three and a half million uh, due to the COVID crisis. We run the NHS apps library. library. So these are approved apps to help people, uh, generally to help people manage their own uh, health and care. Um, lots of uh, interesting and, and useful apps on that, which have been through some kind of approval process um, to, um, to, to give a, an idea that they're safe to use. We also provide the data security and protection toolkit, uh, which helps organizations to maintain their security and confidentiality. Um, some of you in children's services will know about CPIS, the Child Protection Information Sharing System, which is a way of being able to uh, share the child protection status of a child, whether they're on a CPP uh, or uh, are a looked after child, uh, in order to be able to protect those children should they uh, go into unscheduled care settings. We do data collections from local authorities to, uh, around adult social care to analyze how needs are being met. Um, and we started off the digital workforce program, uh, which Denise mentioned at the beginning of her presentation. That's now transferred to Health Education England. Um, we also have a dedicated social care program, uh, which supports health and social care transitions. So hospital discharge, for example, and social care provider digitization. So this is 
particularly focusing on residential and nursing homes and domiciliary care. Can you move to the next slide, please? So just to give you the background to the digital capabilities work, um, in, I was appointed as chief social worker here in 2016. And in that year, looking at, looking at how our colleagues in the health service, the clinicians within the health service, doctors, nurses, and others, how they were involved in um, digital technology. So basically, they, they, they're involved at every stage in the commissioning and implementation of new systems. And I thought, you know, that's not been my experience as a social worker. Often, <laughs> um, my experience had been to have a, a, a kind of inadequate system foisted on me by somebody who wasn't a social worker and, and kind of, I guess, a bit of resentment around that. And um, seeing how the NHS did this kind of stuff was, was quite interesting to me. So one of the first things that I did was to commission a small research project through Sky on how um, digital was used by social workers. And it will be no surprise to many of you uh, that the key frustrations from that piece of work were around information sharing. Uh, and different um, different uh, cultures around information sharing between different professions, uh, and on frustrations around mobile working as well, um, not having the, the necessary kit or connections in order to be able to uh, help social workers to to work effectively in a mobile way. So, in 2017, following that, I had a number of discussions with. Uh, local authority social workers in different parts of the country, principal social workers, uh, and also with uh, social work students uh, in a number of visits to universities to just gain, gain some further information really. And as a result of that, uh, secured some funding in 2018 for the Digital Capabilities for Social Work project, which, uh, which we're talking about today. Um, you know, since then, this is really broadened out and uh, in, in conjunction with the people that have been involved on the advisory group with Sky and Baswa, we've had a series of conversations with the Chief Social Workers for England, for example, with uh, Social Work England as the new regulator coming in, ADAS, ADCS, Principal Social Worker Networks, Skills for Care, who've got a responsibility for uh, social care providers, but also now for the uh, PSW Networks, which many of you will know. Uh, Social work academics, uh, uh, Denise, of course, uh, Amanda, who Denise mentioned in her uh, in her presentation, with with Socotim, which many of you will have heard of, the Socotim are the uh, key membership organisation for IT professionals in uh, local government, uh, and particularly interested in this area of work, and also with NICE, the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence. Um, and as a result of all that, in in 2019. Uh, the project, the Digital Capabilities for Social Work project started uh, uh, with uh, Health Education England and we commissioned Sky and Basel to do that piece of work. Just move on to the final slide, please. So th this is a bit of a, <laughs> when I sent this to uh, Ruth and others yesterday, I, I, I said this is a bit of a personal manifesto, which it is, but this is, this is what I think to be the relevance of this piece of work and the relevance of further work going forward. So what, what I would like to do is to maintain a, a dialogue with the profession and with other stakeholders on digital technology and data within social work going forward. I, I think it's really important that we have an opportunity to be able to do that as a profession. Um, I want us to be able to develop evidence-based practice on the use of digital. So, you know, what are the most effective ways uh, of using different kinds of digital technology that are going to benefit uh, our uh, service users? Uh, what, what are the best ways uh, for uh, social workers to be able to use data um, and, and all of the other uh, digital treasures that we've got, but also how to use those things safely. Uh, and that's a key thing really, both for the safety of the practitioners themselves, but also the safety of our service users. And um, also to identify social work digital leaders and digital expertise within the profession one of the interesting things about this piece of work has been um, uncovering people who are really technically proficient, for example, and who have developed apps 
uh, which are designed to help uh, social workers with the transactional tasks that they need to do, but also to be able to uh, help service users and provide a, a better service to them. I want to ensure voice and representation of social work in digital in initiatives, both nationally and locally. So, you know, there's a huge amount going on and, and will be following this COVID crisis about how um, public services use digital more effectively. And I want social work to be able to have a voice in that at a national level, but also locally. I, I mentioned my experience of um, uh, of not being involved in the commissioning of digital systems as a social worker. And, and that's really just not good enough. And I, I want to make sure that whenever um, uh, digital um, resources are being developed within a local authority, that there is a social work voice there, an informed social work voice, uh, which is listened to in relation to uh, what, what is developed and commissioned locally. Uh, I want us to provide resources and support to social workers and students in the use of digital um, and particularly around developing knowledge, both at a student level uh, and also on an ongoing level uh, in relation to CPD. But I'm particularly interested in, in issues of values and ethics, which are uh, two things which have cropped up um, through this programme and are being discussed now in relation to the COVID crisis as well. Um, and also, you know, there's a lot of talk about integration of social care and health, particularly in relation to adult social care and adult social work. Um, and I want to make sure that that's led by social work professionals. So when we're talking about integration, is it is it good for us as a profession and is it good for the people that we work with? Uh, and to make sure that we're taking that unique social work perspective in terms of those discussions around uh, uh, integration. And that was it really from me. Or I was muted then. Technical, digital fail. Thanks, Mark. That was really fascinating. Let's leave that 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 slide up about the aims of the future because it's really very powerful. I think, and I think captures a lot of like where we've got to in this whole project. Um, could I could I come now to some questions which uh, I think kind of pick up on themes that that everybody's uh, presented on. Uh, Steph, could you go back to that previous um, slide? Thank you. And we'll leave that one up because I think thank you. Um, there's a question here about um, which picks up on the values and ethics. And one of the things to say about the, the capabilities documents that are available on the Basel website, you've got the capability statement itself, which deals with these, these uh, key areas of, of practice, key areas of capability um, and the kinds of impact that social workers can have by having more uh, digital capability. And there's also what we've called an ethical considerations document. Um, ethics is emerging in the field of, dig of digital and of course there are many things which guide our ethics, many professional and regulatory requirements in relation to ethics, but there are specific um, ethical considerations and we've tried to list those out in a way that should help you as practitioners or as managers, supervisors, educators, think, help people think through what the ethical issues are when they're considering a particular action that is digitally um, in, in a digital mode whether it's a new thing or thing they've always been doing, from recording to whether to use a particular app, some of the ethical considerations. And here's a question which I think is really interesting um, that's come in, um, which relates to rights and ethics. Should social work be advocating for digital and technological access as a fundamental right for the citizens that we work with? Would anybody like to, to pick up on that? Can, can I have a first go at that? Yeah. Um, yes. This was something that I meant to mention in the in the course of uh, of, of my slides, really. But yeah, that, that's a really interesting and and uh, and useful question, I think, because you know, in, increasingly, we the the ability to be able to use digital technology and participate in what is becoming a digital world, it is is a fundamental right for people. And, you know, as a as a social worker, we need to learn and understand about rights, uh, privilege uh, and so on. Um, and, and we do that, you know, in terms of race, gender, uh, sexuality and, and others, disability and so on. Um, but but digital access, I think, is is another one that we should be thinking about and learning about 
um, when we train social work students. And it's certainly something that we should be thinking about when we're working with, with individuals, because if they can't participate in a digital world, if, if that right is denied to them, then they're going to miss out on such a huge amount, um, but both in terms of the advantages of living in a digital society, but also in terms of services that they should be receiving and, and, and perhaps, you know, particularly at the moment, wouldn't be receiving unless it's through uh, a digital route. So, yeah, really good question and something that I think bears uh, further discussion and examination. Thanks. Yeah, uh, Denise, please. Again, I was just going to build on what Mark said and say that, you know, certainly um, myself and colleagues do try to address that in, in social education. Something that springs to my mind, um, while people have maybe some of some people have got more time to watch um, than they might have previously done is I, Daniel Blake, um, which brings, okay. which, uh, which many of you will um, have seen and which just foregrounds that that digital exclusion um, very painfully, actually. Um, and it's also it's something that we face in social work education as well that we can't necessarily expect that students, social work students, will be able to afford the hardware or whatever or the soft, you know, that we might expect them to. So I think it's a really important point at, at all levels of social work. Thank you. Um, thanks, Denise. Um, we've got a question uh, coming in now in relation to leadership. Again, it probably picks, on, picks up on one of your points, Mark. Um, does this programme of work highlight that we need national social work digital lead or leadership or leaders? Um, uh, where does that come from? PSW Network, BASWA, Chief Social Workers. Um, Mark, would you like to say a little bit more? I mean, you've mentioned this, but actually it is a really crucial part of this programme is that we are, because we are hoping to develop strategic leadership and we're also going to be publishing examples of good practice of local leadership as well, which is another resource that will come onto the website um, soon. But Mark, did you want to say anything else um, on that? I know that it can, be, it can be quite confusing, I think, for social workers um, to know where to go to get definitive guidance on things that aren't in statute um, and uh, even some of the things that are in statute it can be hard so where what's your, what are your thoughts on where that leadership should come from Mark? Yeah I, I think um, I think there's various different routes for that relationship for, for that um, to come from and I think that I think that there's an onus on those of us who, who are working nationally to, to do what we can. So um, I participate in a, in a number of different uh, national forums around digital, uh, around social care and digital, uh, and around the health service and integration and digital as well. But you know that that then there need to be there need to be more than just me participating in those national uh, national forums. And you know I think uh, having people who can who can do that in in an informed way that are empowered and enabled to be able to to do that I think gives uh, a, a much better a much broader voice for the profession. But also on on a local basis as well I think that. Um, going around and talking to principal social workers in different local authorities, as I have done over the last few, few years, th there's a great difference in terms of uh, when, for example, a new case record system is being commissioned. In some cases, social workers are not involved in that at all. Uh, in other, and in other cases, they're central and nothing really happens in terms of that commissioning and implementation of that, of that system without uh, a clear social work steer. So I, I think, I think I think it's about creating an expectation, actually, an expectation that we should be involved at a national level and that we, um, we need to have the, the skills and the knowledge to be able to be involved in a meaningful way, um, but also that we should be involved locally as well in, in those decisions that are being taken, which you know, affect the day-to-day -day work of, of social workers all across the country. Yeah. Mark, thank you. Godfred, and then I'm going to go to a couple of other questions. So, Godfred, yeah. I think I wanted to add to what Mark um, has just said, that leaders and leadership is important, but also the model of leadership is also really important around this. 
because of the number of stakeholders who sometimes have objectives that don't always align. So it's important that that leadership is really underscored and underpinned by social work values, as well as the interests, the, um, the needs of people who use services. So it's not, so as we all know, digital technology is just not neutral or objectives. There are issues of power bound up in, in that as well. So it's the type of leadership, which should be inclusive leadership is also really important as well as the leaders. Thanks, and that actually, picks up the, that actually picks up on one of the other questions um, that came through, where people were saying, "Well, actually, the leaders in my organisation don't um, don't actually understand social work that well." So, of course, that would be very different in different places. But there's something about a strategic leadership, technology leadership, in needing to actually, as Mark was saying, hear the voice of social workers understand what the practice challenges are and therefore create technological um, environments and resources um, and training and development uh, opportunities which fit the social work task and the need, ultimately the needs of the people we work with. Um, yeah. We're getting quite a number of questions where people are asking about recommendations for, cert for particular kinds of um, apps or you know what is the advice on type questions and we're not, we're not going to be able to um, answer specific what's the advice on questions for particular approaches but i'd like to raise it as a kind of a, ge a general uh, a general point just for your comments really is how do social workers um, uh, where should social workers go to understand what they can and can't use that might be quite a simple question at one level we could say perhaps your organizations should be providing you with with guidance and if they're not particularly at the moment you should be having that guidance and i think it needs to be positively oriented but also um, you know, ma manage managing risks and there's also questions about when is a, a video assessment um, an online assessment uh, rather than face-to-face -face, um, appropriate and i don't know whether um anybody would like to to come in to come in on that um on that point any of the panelists like to come in on that point I'm happy to. Yes. Uh, yeah, Mark, that. do you want to come in? Yes, that'd be helpful. So, yeah, so in terms of recommended apps, um, there, are, there, are, there are lots of things to think about in relation to that. So, I, I mean, first of all, to say I'm not a techie, um, especially in comparison to some of the kind of really clever people that we've got here at NHS Digital, but um, um, I think it, it, some of this is common sense, isn't it? So. You know, you, you will be uh, aware that um, with apps and with other forms of software, uh, there'll be various different versions uh, which crop up. So some of those uh, will um, be approved by whoever, you know, let's say the NHS apps library. But every time there's a new iteration of the app, uh, it needs to be reapproved <laughs> because it might have um, it might uh, be inadvertently leaking people's contact details or, or using those contact details in an inappropriate way. So it's a complete minefield. Um, I, I would suggest that uh, if there are apps on the NHS apps library, which are uh, useful to social workers in terms of working with the, uh, the people that they work with, uh, then by all means use those. You know, there is some kind of assurance there for other apps. I, this is where I think that we need to work very closely as a profession with our IT colleagues. Uh, and, you know, they need to, to be honest, it's on them as well, to work very closely with us. Uh, and I think I've seen good examples uh, various places in the country of where you know, a social worker getting together with the, uh, with the IT person and um, recognising and respecting each other's expertise and having an open conversation as to whether um, the risks of using a particular app or a particular software program uh, outweigh the, um, the, the uh, benefits that you get from using it. So risks and benefits and having that conversation about uh, whether it's appropriate or not to, to use. So having that dialogue with your uh, IT colleagues in your local authority, uh, I think is something that I would recommend for apps that you might want to use locally. 
Thanks, Mark. I'm just conscious we're actually um, come up to our to the end of our hour, in fact. Um, and I'd just um, like to, there's one uh, question that's been, I think, been on my mind and it's come through that I'd quite like, a, just maybe a short answer for, from each of you, if that would be okay, panellists. I'll tell you what it is now. Do you anticipate that um, this will lead, that there will be a reduction of office-based social work um, and increases in the use of digital after the COVID-19 crisis has abated. So, um, in uh, in a, in a few words, would would any of you like to to address your thoughts on that, Godfrey? Uh, yes, just if I can uh, start. I think what COVID has really shifted the perception and conversation around digital technology and social work. Previously, there's, there's, there's been a sort of inclination to take a risk-based perspective, and now there's engagement with it, and, and perhaps as a result of that, some of the benefits are becoming more and more apparent, and the potential is becoming more apparent. So I think there'll be the, but also there, there are cost benefits associated with, with, with digital. So there might be the inclination to, to make things more digital-based, what I would say, though, is that all through this, as we have highlighted in the digital capability statement, the core issue should be relationship-based practice and what the needs of the people that we work with are. What do service users say around it? So if the shift should really be accompanied by a, a, a strict focus on relationship-based practice and meeting the needs of people who use services and not necessarily around costs or anything else. Thanks, Godfrey. Yes, it runs through our documents, doesn't it? How does digital support the relationships that we need in order to do social work rather than um, any distortion of that? So thanks very much. Denise, would you like to? Yeah, I think, I mean, I suppose none of us know, do we? We're in a we're in a brave new world in, in many ways of what's going to happen when we come out the other side of this. But I suppose I go back to what I said before, which is that I think um, we've been kind of projected, you know, very sharply into, into doing some things that we've had to do through expedience. Um, and I would want to make sure that that our baseline is that we we always keep to our benchmarks and our, our professional standards in anything that that we use so um you know i i think godfrey's right i think it has it has created a sort of forced engagement with digital technology but i think we have to be very cautious and 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 wary of that as well and anything that we might have done at this time we have to to make sure that that's you know that's going to be ethical moving forward and that's linked to just very briefly what I was going to say around the recommended apps, which is just one one very small thing, um, is to be wary of anything that's free. Um, it's never free. Um, <laughs> you know, there is always a cost somewhere. So I think, um, you know, I, as Godfrey said, I welcome the, the engagement with digital technology, but I, I think we have to be very cautious uh, around it moving forward as well. Thank you. And Mark, would you like to, um, finish on that one. Yeah, short answer is uh, yes. Uh, I think uh, it, it will have an impact longer term. Um, a, a colleague of mine who's a GP has been trying to introduce video consultations in his CCG for 20 years and in two weeks has 100% uh, adoption of that. Now, I'm not saying it's entirely going to be a good thing because, um, you know, I'm, I'm old enough to uh, feel less or more comfortable rather, uh, doing social work face-to-face, -face, sat, sat across a room. Uh, I think I think there's a, a lot that social workers can get from that face-to-face -face interaction. But if it's a choice between receiving a service and not, which it may well be um, ar around uh, funding and also the need to protect staff and individuals if, if something like this recurs again, um, then you know we need to we need to be using and embracing digital technology. So I think it, I think there'll definitely be an increased uptake. Thank you, Mark. Well, we're going to draw to a close there, and uh, it seems to me just on that last question that uh, 
this current crisis has drawn into sharp relief how we may need to accelerate how we can use digital um, and what's possible with it. I suspect when we come out the other side, we will be re-evaluating how important it is to work in real world, real world environments and we'll be re-appreciating the importance of that. But maybe actually one of the one of the learnings will be how we balance um, the real world encounters and what, what that uh, provides um, to the people we work with and what it provides to us as, as professionals um, and balancing that with what we can get um, from increasing our digital uh, resources, the technologies and, and capabilities. I hope this has been useful. Please do uh, visit the Basel website. The links for that will be in the resources attached to this, um, to this webinar. You can uh, download there all of the documents, obviously, for free. Um, and there were a number of other questions um, about specific areas of practice. I'm going to take some of those away and think about what else Basel might do to help support you um, with some of those particular practice questions. Um, that relate to, to digital capabilities and um, the digital world. Thank you very much. Uh, take care, stay safe, um, and hope to see you again on another webinar soon. Bye-bye.